Chris and I are back. We're going to spend the next hour or so talking about color match and color theory and, and all these yeah. things that can impact it. And uh, we're going to try to stage it out so it, it kind of goes from, you know, cradle to grave, so to say. So from beginning to end and, and kind of how some of this stuff works. So we're going to take a look at first how lighting impact uh, really affects your color selection. And by doing that, we can see on this red car, there's four different spectrums here. So we have nighttime, we have noon, we have fluorescent, and we have sunset. And when we look at that, we can see very visibly how this stuff is affecting the shade of this red. So when we're in a shop, it's the, the, the first thing you'll run into, and, and I know Chris can, can back me up on this, is you can have a paint line in 20 different shops and 10 shops say, color match is great, spectacular, no problem, right? Yeah. And the other 10 have a problem all the time. And what you really have to, to look at here is from the ground up. So every shop has a different lighting source. Every shop has different ways that they match light. So what you really want to try to do is determine how do we decide where we're going to do this color match? How do we know how our lighting is correct? And a big part of this is the way that we see color as a, as, as a human being, right? So a couple of different things that, that we have to look at is... We have, a, we have a light source, right? And in the light source, we have light temperature. So you can see here uh, under this, how your light source affects your color match. We have a Kelvin rating. And the Kelvin rating is gonna go from 1000 the whole way up to 10,000. And in your 1000, which you're gonna call warm light, you get into this really orange yellow yeah. casting. Incandescent bulbs. And right, right. And you're you know, in a shop, depending on the lighting that you have, you're going to have maybe different versions of this and this different Kelvin rating. So from 1000 at this warm to this 10,000 at cool, that's really going to start to shift the way we perceive color as a painter, as an estimator. Uh, anybody working on the car is going to see this a little bit differently. So what we have to be very mindful of when we're, when we're picking this area to match color is that we have something that's mimicking natural light. So you can notice that there's a, a 6,000 K and 6,000 5,500. It's pure white light. And that's what we're looking for. Chris, I mean, would you agree that, that we need this neutral, we need this white color with, with no refractance at all? Yeah. Light that's not leaning towards the red side or the blue side. That's going to influence the way that your perception of that color is. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at, you know, perception and, you know, along with Kelvin, there's a whole second thing that we're looking at here when we're talking about color match, and that's what's known as the CRI. So as you can see with CRI and how it affects your light source on, on your color match, the CRI is known as the, the color rendering index. And what it is, it's a, it's a measurement that basically tells us how clean this color looks. So if we're in a situation where we have really great Kelvin, right? Like, I don't know, 5,500 or so, and then we have a really low CRI, it's gonna affect the way that we perceive that color as a person. So this, this particular, uh, what we're looking at right now shows on the left side, we have a 5,000 K natural light with perfect CRI and it's reflecting this apple back perfectly red. So we know as people that an apple is red and that's the way that works. If we look at an artificial light source with 5,000 K, while the temperature is correct, it's got a low CRI. So what's happening is, depending on how low it is, it's now gonna reflect us something else, orange or maybe a blue shade. In the bottom, you're gonna notice the CRI on these apples. You have 70, 80, 90, and 97. So what we're looking for in this body shop environment when we're talking about making a correct color match and making it so it's undetectable. We want 5,500 Kelvin and we want a, a 95 or higher CRI. These are all important. So Chris, what are your, you know, with, you've been in this business a long time and, you know, the Kelvin and the CRI, it's something that doesn't really get talked about a lot. And, you know, there's a lot of value there in understanding it. There is. And, and, and I'm glad you bring up that it's a balance of both of not only Kelvin, but CRI, where you can go and buy bulbs that are in that white band. And when we say white, like you said, 5,000 to about 6,000 Kelvin but then the CRI rating is bad. Or you get something that's even too intense where it starts leaning towards the blue side and the CRI may be good, but how is that CRI measured? Right. Which, which is another aspect that we'll get into as well. 
So, you know, this whole thing with, with color and perception and how we see it, it's, it's really easy to trick the human eye. It's, oh, sure. it's a simple thing to do. And us as a, as a painter, as a color matcher, we're basically a magician. You know, we have to figure out how do we get this thing close enough and what tools do we use to really help analyze this and, and make this magical. So we have a, a yellow and blue swatch here that you can see. And the reason we do this is because they're, they're so opposite. So when I pull up this, this gray double-sided arrow that you can see, right now looking at it, you see one color. Yeah. You, see, you see this gray uh, arrow and there's really not a whole lot of question about that. The moment that you put a line through it, now you see this color shift. So you have this perception that now on the left side, this arrow is bluer and the right side, the arrow is more yellow. And it's all, it's all perception and how our eyes start to dictate things. So now what's happening is since we have a clear separation of the two, our eyes are focusing on each one individually and then it's reversing what we're seeing. So it's all one big illusion. So the thing that we have to talk about that, that's really important is we know that we have things that are going to affect us. We're going to affect our color match. And unfortunately, we have weather, we have rain, we have snow, we have clouds, we have all these things. And you can't always get a, a car outside. It's just not, it's not always doable. Sure. So the big question that, that comes into play is how do you determine, how do you determine that your shop, you're matching properly, right? So it's raining out right now, I gotta match this silver. I have to choose what steps, I have to pick a place to do this so I can be repetitive every time I do a color match. Yeah, and, ju and just to put a finer point on that, outside in the sun, in natural daylight, is gonna be like our number one goal of this is the best location to be choosing which variant or which prime chip we're gonna be spraying on this vehicle or checking your spray out cards to it. But as you bring up inclement weather, overcast day, it's raining outside. Now we've got to bring that vehicle inside and do that color evaluation inside in the shop where we may have not given any consideration to the quality of light uh, that's in the conditions we're about to, to evaluate this color. It, it's so true. And, and what we have to figure out is, you know, we have a, uh, an idea of we think we have good shop lighting or my shop is bright and, and it's really great and I don't have color problems in here, but sometimes I take a car outside and it's night and day and I'm reshooting it. So what we want to figure out is how do we have a measurable way to know that what we're doing every single time is correct. And we have a tool and that tool, as you can see here, is called a Pantone D65 lighting indicator. And Chris, can you kind of, you know, you're really well versed on these D65s and, and the lighting indicators. Can you kind of explain, you know, the way these work and, and what the, the painter is looking for? Sure. And in fact, just to give you the consent soup uh, story on where these come from, I, I spent some time with a, with a premium paint company prior to coming to SADA and, and Dan Am, and uh, we would do color submissions to OEM. So you're talking about two different people and I'm creating a color for you and you live in another state or another country and I'm creating a whole series of a color. Maybe it's a new blue. So I'll spray out a half a dozen blue cards and then I'm going to send those to you. And when you're looking at those colors to choose what's going to be on this next model year, I need to ensure some way that you're viewing the color that I expected you to right. view. So what we would do is when we would do those spray out cards, we would actually take one of these and I'm going to peel one off here, but it's a Pantone lighting indicator sticker. And we would put one of these on, on the panel. And what you're seeing here, not only in the slide that, that we've got up, but you can probably see this on this card here is in light that does not contain the full spectrum of color from 400 to 700 nanometers representing all of those colors throughout the spectrum it appears to be two different colors. Right. And as soon as you introduce light to these stickers that is representative of D65 of what visible or excuse me, what normal natural daylight would be, it then disappears as you'll see on, on really your next slide, which is where those two colors start to go away and that sticker becomes one color. And, and what it's doing is it's, it's such an easy, visual indicator that when you walk into a shop or where you're doing color evaluation, I mean, this, this is not difficult to see, even if you were colorblind, 
that these are two different colors. Right, and it, that's exactly right. And so what we have to understand here is, do we know that where we're matching is a safe place to match? Yeah. And you'll hear your paint company all the time talk about, you know, don't ever match in a booth, and, and they have some good reason for it. Reason A is because it's not good for cycle time, right? We can't match cars inside sure. of a paint booth. It's just not reasonable. Reason two is that you don't really know where this D65 is or where your light source is unless you D65 it. So here's a really great example that we have up that shows a shop with uh, booth lighting where they were under the impression they were at 5500 Kelvin and a 95 CRI. So it's very obvious in, in this particular photo that this shop isn't even in the realm. I mean, this, this booth cannot be color matched. But yet. I bought these bulbs based on your recommendation of right. 5500K and 95 and above. It, ex exactly. CRI. So you, you look at, this is a booth example, and then we're gonna go to the next example, which is, this is actually outside. So it, by, by me looking at this right now, I can kind of tell that this is probably a little bit later in the day. Uh, you don't have that uh, you know, pure, full, bright sunlight, and you're starting to get that warmer shift, and now you can kind of see a little bit of a color difference. So, you know, it, it's one of those deals where it, outside is great, but like Chris had mentioned earlier, it's really important that it's outside and it's, and it's bright light. And if we can't get that bright light, we have to figure out how to simulate that inside. So the same exact shop took these stickers in to the rest of the shop. So ironically, they have pretty good lighting. Yeah. Um, th this particular shop has, has some pretty impressive lighting. So this particular, or this photo right here is showing us the generic shop lighting. So if I'm this shop, I'm not gonna be really confident matching here, but I know I'm close. I'm in, I'm in the ballpark. Better than that first picture for sure. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So what we, have to, what we have to think about when we're talking about, about color and you know, the way that we perceive it. Cause right now we're talking about perception and, and how we see color. And there's a really great way to do this. And luckily with technology, you can see here, we're talking about taking the tests. And what test is this? This is the Farnsworth Munzel 100 Hue test. Chris, did you ever do one as a, as a, as a paint manufacturer? M many, many times. In fact, when I would teach a color adjustment class, once we did the color blindness test, we would roll into this just so I can see how the technicians that are sitting in my classroom, how are they perceiving color? Are they able to see those subtle color shifts? And you know, that brings up a whole other thing where we are under the impression that we can see color well. We sure. just think that by nature, oh, I can see every color. Like 2020 vision. Absolutely. <laughs> And, you know, there's some great data on that. And the, the big data is one in 225 women are colorblind. One in 12 men are colorblind. So, you know, what I would recommend that you do is that you take these, these tests and you can get them online. You can find them. You can do them right on your smartphone. Uh, you want to make sure that you're in a good, you know, well-lit area that's not too obstructed. And, that, you know, the, the important part about this is that you as a painter, you really want to know where you fall in this, in this color world, right? How well do I see color? Is there a space I'm deficient in? Do I have in? a deficiency? Do I have a deficiency? Um, you know, and these tests are designed to, to help us with that, right? So if we know that we, we aren't colorblind and we're able to, you know, look at, look at colors and, and we're confident that, that we can see color correctly, our red blues and, and, our, and our yellows and our greens and all these things, we have to really determine what tool is best for us inside the shop? So if we know that we're good on color and we know that the shop lighting isn't great because of D65, we have to really start to, to analyze where we're doing this color match process and what tools we're using to do this process, right? I mean, would you? Absolutely. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of unknowns out there and I feel like every three months somebody has the latest and greatest color match light and well, this one's only a hundred dollars. So, there's there's a lot of data um some of it's available some of it's not so readily available so if we look at this this true sun by sada if you remember we talked earlier about the kelvin rating and how that temperature affects um the kelvin rating affects you know are you warm are you cool am i going to go bluer am i going to go more yellow we need that night that nice crisp white clean color and we know at 5500 kelvin we have that clean color so the True Sun, Chris, tell us a little bit about the ratings on the True Sun. Yeah, so it, as far as its Kelvin rating, it's at 5,600. And for that exact reason, that's why Target or SADA targeted that, that range of light or Kelvin 
is because it's within that white spectrum. Some color match lights, as they've come out, they do really lean towards either the red side or the assumption is if I go really high in Kelvin, it's a much brighter light. I'm giving right. you more light, so more must be better. In fact, it's not. The more starts shifting things over to the blue side. Right. So we really targeted that 5600 Kelvin and the CRI rating, uh, which is done on 14 bands of CRI. Um, is 97. So I want to keep that 14. I want to really, you know, focus on that because we're gonna we're gonna get into that here very soon. Uh, so now we know kind of where where the true sun falls, and and obviously that's important for us because now we know about Calvin, what we know about CRI. I know that I can go into my shop with a true sun, look at this, and be confident that my Kelvins and my CRIs are going to replicate exactly what I need. There's other there's other light matching uh, equipment out there, and. Some of the, like I had said earlier, some of this information you can get pretty easy. Some of it you, you can't get so easy. And if you kind of look here, I have some, some data up on the sun gun. And the interesting thing about it is it's got a, a great CRI. I believe, it's, I believe the CRI is uh, 99 on both settings. So that's a great CRI. The, the um, interesting thing about the sun gun is that I couldn't get, I couldn't get a Kelvin rating. I can get a lumens rating. And when you're talking about lumens versus Kelvin, you're not really talking about the same thing. Right. Kelvin's is going to be your temperature of light, which is based on nature. Lumens is going to be intensity. is going to be your brightness or your intensity. So they don't really coincide, and you, you can't convert one to the other per se. Right. Um, and it's not that there's anything wrong with a sun gun, uh, but you know if you are in doubt or you think the bulb might be old or you know maybe the battery life is not so great, the easiest way to know is D65. Sure. Um, if you're questioning the light source or the light that you bought, you absolutely want to double check with D65. So with that being said, um, there, there is some really, really uh, interesting stuff here when we're talking about the scan grip. And I remember when these, when these came out and, you know, 150 bucks, man, what a great option. And, and a lot of people bought them before we really started learning a lot about some of these things and and seeing some of these things we didn't really know you know it's like we don't really know is does it work does it not work i, I think sometimes it does but sometimes it, it maybe doesn't do so well for me and if you look at the data on this scan grip you're going to see something here uh that's we're going to talk about two two ways to look at this so what you're looking at right now is the scan grip and there's a picture up of the tool, which pretty much everybody knows how to recognize it. But you're gonna see two interesting things. You're gonna see, it's got a Kelvin rating of 25 to 6,500. And with the spot on, it's at 4,000. So the difficult thing with, with what we're seeing here is that you can notice on this red, yellow, white, and then your blue shades. If I don't know where that Kelvin is every time I pull the trigger, I don't necessarily know if my color matches is, is really correct. So that's one portion of this, and that's an important part because we know the Kelvin has to be good. The other part is talking about CRI, and ScanGrip advertises something called CRI Plus. There really isn't such thing as CRI Plus. We have, uh, CRI is rated from R1 uh, the whole way up to R8, and that's your standard, that's your standard CRI ratings. Yeah. There's something called extended CRI, and the extended CRI is gonna take you from R9 to R14. And the idea here is that you have a standard. So you have a standard for R9, which is your red. You have a standard for your blue. There's a standard that justifies or, or verifies if you have the correct CRI. Interestingly enough, if you have a low average, how do you boost the average up? You add an extra rating. So there is actually something called R15, and there is a 15th R value. The issue with the 15th R value is that there isn't a standard for it because it's considered considered skin tone. Yeah, it's a variable. So it's a variable. And if I can get a high R15 skin tone rating, like this is a 98 R15, I can bring all my averages up. The problem you run into is your R12 on this particular tool is at an 80. So now I know that I have a really strong deficiency in my blue and I'm a 99 in red, so I can tell by looking at this graph, I'm always gonna get boosted red. So it, it's, it's important that before we even talk about, you know, getting into the mixing room and, and how we do things and make spray out cards, that all of this is correct. Yeah, 
And, and, and just to add to that, I don't know that maybe we were clear enough, CRI is an average. So typically the bulbs that you're going to buy that you're going to be shopping for is going to be that R1 through 8. Color match lights or light bulbs from companies like Macbeth where their, their job is dealing with color reproduction with light, you're going to start getting up through that R1 through 14, which is where our light is evaluated at as well. And understand that is an average. So the higher that number is, the better that overall average of representing every one of those bands of color, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's perfect in every spectrum. So having that data, we have that in our literature where we show that where we're strong in every one of those colors rather than just good in the red, orange, yellows or just good in the blues and greens. Right. Yeah, it's important that, that we really understand this light source because I, I just know how critical this is. And the paint manufacturers do a really great job. And you know, they, they, have, a, they have a tough job to do. There's so many variances and, and so many new colors coming out every single day. And you know, back when I got in this and you got in this, there was, if Chrysler had three silvers, it was easy. Now Chrysler has a hundred silvers, yeah. you know, and, and all those variances come into play. So the thing that you have to really think about here, you know, moving away from the light source and, and under the assumption that, that we determined that our light source is good. So we, we pick the spot in the shop and, you know, we have something like the true sun that's going to give us this correct color every single time. We have to now look at how are we doing our process, right? So. Last night we had a, a C20 or finish meeting and I brought Chris in on that and we really started to focus on what happens in that mixing room, right? Yeah. So Chris, you know, as far as, as far as getting toners, what we call in balance versus out of balance and getting them set. If you, if you look here, we, we have, we have a, a photo up and this photo is, is very important because every paint manufacturer doesn't make the same paint. And they all have different technology and different additives and suspension versus not suspension. And so what we need to figure out is what does my paint company require? So when we're talking about the paint company's requirement, they, they have the science backing this up to say, okay, to match our chip or to help with our camera, we have to make sure our toners are set, right? We gotta set them correctly. So in this particular photo, we have two different we have two different uh, lines. We have we have uh, RM Onyx and we have uh, Sickens by Axo Nobel, and they're both waterborne. Now, with with the Onyx to, to get my my toner set, I have to do a 15 minute agitation, and that's a very critical 15 minutes before I put that live with a lid, because now I know my pearls and my metallics and my micas are all into full suspension. So now when I'm on agitation every day, three or four times a day, I'm keeping that toner in balance where it needs to be. Uh, with the auto wave, just as another example, and this isn't picking on anybody, it's just showing the differences. They don't require that, that shaking. And you brought up a really great point last night. Uh, something that comes up very frequently is I shook her for 15 minutes, or maybe I shook her for 12 or I lost track. The first thing somebody wants to do is pop the lid, put a stick in the bottom. Now we got clumps, <laughs> the toner is off balance. So maybe, you know, talk a little bit about what you, what your thoughts are on backups. Cause I think that is very valuable. So. And first off, every paint company with the technology that you're shooting, it's going to have uh, a best practices. So a mixing room best practices for those toners. Do they require 15 minutes or five minutes on a shaker? Then once you're done with the shaker, do you need to plug it with the dosing lid that has the mechanical agitator? Following those as well. Something that I used to teach people with, you know, solvent borne lines or lines that do have a tendency to settle out is I would take my backups and store them upside down. And the logic there was, you know, I always joke with guys that, uh, you know, when the paint store was delivering that can, it rolled back and forth in the back <laughs> seat or in the bed of the, the it's Ford so Ranger. True. And that it kind of got shook on the way to the shop. Uh, but by storing it upside down, when I'm in need of that, right? I'm in the middle of a formula and right. that's when you're gonna find out that toner's out, right? It's not when you show up in the morning or maybe it should be that you're checking your toners and seeing which ones am I gonna run out of today? What should I get on a shaker? Before the car's in the booth, you've already got the first coat on and you're trying to remix. But it's always in the middle of that formula, you're pouring it, you run out, I need to get my backup. Well, putting that backup toner on a shaker for 15 minutes as a painter, at least in my house, I'm extremely impatient. It feels like an hour. It I does. don't have time it, for this. It, yeah, I don't have time. So I, I take it off, I give it a quick shake and I pop that lid. 
The advantage of storing them upside down is the settling that takes place in those cans, it's going to settle on the lid. So you put it on the shaker, you shortcut it, you pull that off, you pop that lid, you're going to see pigment settled on that lid. And rather than putting the stick in the bottom and scooping up those chunks of, of the settle, it's going to force you to put that lid back on and have a little bit of patience and put it on the shaker. I just love that visual indicator, but and it's something that you know, as long as I've been in this business, nobody ever even told me that. And and I just think how great that is because you get some of these super coarse metallics and oh, yeah. you know, it, the thing the thing about you're talking about toners is it could have been at the manufacturer plant for six months and then sure. it was at your jobber for three months. Now you got something nine months old and you have a caked up thick bottom of flake. Yeah. That might take more than 15 minutes to get in suspension. So that visual indicator, um, you know, on the back of that lid is is fantastic. So the the thing that, that is is so important when we're talking about this is it can really really be detrimental to to your paint shop. And we have something you can look at here, and, and this photo is is a great indicator and a great visual of what you see in an off balance mixing bank. So we we have two photos up here and. The backstory of this is I had a, a shop and this shop was, was always great. The camera worked good and, and their, their chips always matched. And all of a sudden they started having problems, right? And, and it's like you go through all the, the stuff, the work you can do to figure it out. And the last thing you want to see is this. This is not the thing you want to see. So if you notice, um, these two, what, what we're looking at here, this is how you check opacity of a toner or, or toner consistency. You take a piece, two pieces of plexiglass. You take a drop off of what you feel um, is a compromised bank and a, a drop off of what you know is a good bank. You squeeze it between the two plexiglass and what you're looking for is consistency. So in this example, we can tell that this orange toner on the left where the arrow is pointing, it is so far opaque that one gram of that versus one gram of the correct is two to, it's way different colors now. Yeah. And, and you can't recover from that. The one on the right looks a little bit closer but it's probably in suspension to some extent, but it's not near transparent enough. And unfortunately, in a situation like this, it is almost impossible to track down which toners are actually bad. So unfortunately, this was a full toner replacement. Uh, and that's not, that's not a cheap endeavor. Not at all. And, and, and to add to that, you know, shaking something or, or having that patience to let it get fully into suspension, you're dealing with not only a color formula, right? So we'll call that a recipe. There's also a formula that goes into that toner to create that toner. And if you're not giving it that full suspension, that full agitation, and you're just like, you know what? I gotta get it. It's a very little bit of, that's in this formula. Throw in the couple grams, couple parts. No problem, this car got out the door. But what happens to that formula that requires a larger portion of that? Right. You've taken that can, that, that, that toner, poured off an imbalanced amount of it, and now every color that I mix afterwards with that toner, it's, it's off strength. Right. It's no longer gonna be giving me that reproducibility and that consistency that I need. Now you do that with one, that's one thing. But you've got this mixing bank of, you know, somewhere between 55 and 65 toners. Right. And over time you start throwing things off. How many times have you got to the bottom of a, a toner and you go to replace it? and there's all that settle and that hard that's on the agitation paddle. Yeah, and the, the unfortunate part about that is, you know, through the life of that toner, you may have made 40 or 50 colors that you documented with a spray out. Yeah. And sadly, that spray out, those spray out cards you made are pretty much null and void because the inconsistency of the toner put way too much shift in the color Absolutely. and there's just no recovering from that. So Chris, I, I know that, you know, the technology in there, and I think it, it's it's really it's really been coming out. Um, we the chips have been great for the paint manufacturers, and uh, they've done a really good job at getting variances out there and and really making a case for you know use your chips and, and check your cards and all that stuff. The way color is going now, the way that the manufacturers are designing color, the way that the paint manufacturers have to replicate those colors. There's a lot of technology in there. There's a lot of toners in there, and. The thing that we that we really have to focus on now as as painters is what are we actually doing to this panel to know that we can verify this color, right? Because if the 2014 Ultima comes in and it's 
charcoal or it's silver or it's white. I wipe it off real quick. I go got my variance chips. Oh, none of these match. This is no good. Now I'm gonna now I'm gonna start the tinning process and and I might spend a day on this depending on how off it is. The thing we have to look at, and this is a great visual indicator you can see here. This is a uh, this is a charcoal colored fender. And if I was in a shop looking at this, looking at what I'm seeing right here, you can see a very definitive line of this very high gloss, clean, fresh looking color. And on my right, I have this very dull drab blue shade. So if I'm going to spend all my effort matching to the right side, when the car is actually the color of the left side, we have a problem. Um, yeah. You're matching to a weathered clear coat that's that's affecting the actual undercolor. Absolutely. So what we what we have to think about here before we even really you know match the car, we have to get the car correct, right? We we have to make sure that we spend ten minutes or so and you know really do a great job at detailing a, a, a you know a larger portion of it, so we have something to look at. Yeah. So when you know when you were with your with, with the paint company you were with, um, and you would go into a shop and and you would see a guy matching the color. How often, how often would you go in and you would see them matching something that was weathered or? Oh, yeah. Far too often. Yeah. Far too often. Walk in and, and if you get glass cleaner and a towel, you're in great shape, right? right. Or in right. their opinion, you are. Oftentimes it's wipe the dirt off, hold the chip up and see what the adjacent panel or my blend panel looks like. It's really when those shops start stepping up their SOPs and really focus on picking the right color the first time. My approach, and I'm sure we'll dive a little bit deeper into this, but my approach is always tinting should be my absolute last resort. Yeah, for sure. There, there's so many other things we can do from your, your chip decks, your lighting source, cleaning up those panels, a spectrophotometer, what, what I can do with my solvent selection, my paint guns, my air pressure, my application method. There's so many other tools we have in our toolbox that just looking at a color and immediately saying, no, I got to tint it. Right. Add tint time on the estimate and I'm going to get in here and start cocktailing something. Yeah. And you brought a really great point up about, about taking these steps to not have to adjust. So if you look at the screen now and, and, and this picture that we have up, this is a clear indicator of where, where paint was and where paint has come. And this is a great example of, what we talked about an hour or so ago, we went live and working with your estimator. This is a Ford code RR and RR in this paint line takes a specialty toner. And, and this specialty toner really gives you that blood red deep appearance that you need. So what we have to be aware of is if we're going to look up color by chip, or we're going to look up a formula, if we see a solution that, that is for this car that takes one of these specialty toners or takes, you know, maybe a, a certain Zerillic or, or, you know, a dye base of, of some sort. We're, we gotta be confident that's probably gonna match. Um, you know, you're still gonna have to do your, your spray out panel and things like that, but as the paint manufacturer starts to develop and incorporate these specialty toners, we know we can have that sigh of relief, like, okay, well now we don't have to rely on, you know, the toners that have been here for five years when this color is new and I can't match this, yeah. right? Yeah. So, the, the other thing that we have to think about here, because you know technology is, is really helping us out, is these cameras. And the paint companies, I, I remember when I started in this business, if we wanted a camera shot, you'd call the jobber and hey, can you bring, the camera, bring the camera over? Camera and <laughs> they'd take three shots and you spray it out and it wouldn't match, but you just did it for fun anyway. Yeah. And now the technology in these cameras is, is really just spectacular. Um, it, it's it's, I'm really impressed at how far they've come. And I think that says a lot for like x right and the way they're able to develop this stuff because these cameras are brilliant. They really are. Oh, absolutely. They are. And the thing, the thing about camera success, and I'm gonna give a, a shout out to one of our guys from last night. When we talked about setting up to do a camera shot, um, you know, the, the, the paint manufacturer is gonna have a process and the processes are all pretty close. It's gonna be clean it, tri-zact it most likely, compound, compound yeah. it, polish it, and do, and do those things. And that's all, that's all really good. But something I, I never thought of, and it came up last night in one of our, our C20 or finish members, is he was having color match problems, as you remember, with his camera. And he said, you know, nothing was matching. And just for the sake of it, he decided that he would start clay barring the car first, then sand it, then buff it, then take the camera shot. 
And if you think about that, depending on where you live, uh, depending on your environment, if you're heavy with rail dust or mineral deposits, there is a really good chance that camera is going to pick that stuff up. Oh, absolutely. And not give you as good of a reading. Yeah. So when you would, when you were back in a shop or when you know you're out there doing your trainings and stuff, were you using the camera much back then? Here and there, it, and truly, when I was a trainer from 2000 to 2007, it was it was still those days of call the jobber. They'd walk in with the suitcase and take the picture. Right. There were the recommendations, but but it really wasn't getting to the shop level at that point. Now, where there's so many spectros in shops, having these SOPs and understanding, getting that panel, and that was him switching to a clay bar was just birthed out of necessity. He was noticing he was getting very inconsistent color. It wasn't giving him the results that, that should be expected. Like you say, you got nine shops where it works great and one where it doesn't. Right. What's the variable at that one where it doesn't? And he was able, he, and he even admitted on, on the, the deal yesterday where he has a rail dust issue. Yep. The, he's right in Philly. There's lots of trains that come into that big station there and rail dust is an issue. And the only way he could, the Spectro is not, it's an intelligent tool, but it doesn't know if there's dirt left on the panel. Right. That's for you to get off and get a clear representation of the color to then take a picture of. Yeah, and you know the, the cameras they've because none of us are scientists. I mean, we're, we're painters, and, and we grew up sanding primer and you know stick match and stuff. They've done a great job at, at really simplifying the camera process for us, right? So I take a scan, and depending on my paint manufacturer, depending on you know that particular tool, it's going to give me some kind of rating, right? So it's going to say, all right, scan, scan the color, and it's going to give me, you know, maybe a, a one through a hundred, or an A, B, or C, or a one through ten, and that's really helping to simplify the process for us. Okay, how do I pick a color? I pick the highest rating. What you're going to start to see, and we're seeing it now, you'll take a camera shot, and in that camera shot, you may have your top five are all very similar ratings. But then when you look at the formulations, they're a little bit different. And it's like, well, now how do I determine, how do I do this? How do I make, am I gonna make five spray outs? I mean, what, what's the answer here? Sure. And while they all don't have it, many of the, the paint companies um, within their camera software, they're able to provide you with the spectral curve data. And if you look at the screen up that we have right now, I, I like, I love this a lot. I, I love this photo because it's a great, it's a great reference point uh, to what spectral curve is. And I think that if, if, you're a, if you're a painter and you hear things about spectral curve and nanometers and wavelengths, it sounds really complicated, right? Like, oh no, I, there's no way I can do I this. just wanna pull a trigger. <laughs> That's what I wanna do, like, just give me a close match and shoot it. But if you can learn a spectral curve and you can understand how actually easy it is, it makes that color picking process very simple. So. I like this. I like this example because it's showing us what's going on here. And like you had mentioned earlier, our eyes visually can only see 380 to 760 nanometers. Before that, after that, we can't pick it up. So this is the this is a curve showing the color of spinach. And it's funny, but we all know that spinach is green, unless you have a blue green deficiency, and maybe you don't. <laughs> um, but you can tell where the arrow is pointing that it's peaking out at 550 nanometers, and that's telling us that. It's peaked out at 550 and I'm seeing all green. There's no question that this is green. Before that and after that are leaving our reference point. So we can't even pick the other colors up. The great part about learning a spectral curve is when you start to read them and you can use this, this picture on the left that's showing red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and violet, they're showing you where that rating falls. So 500 to 565 is green. It's on the tail end of cyan and the beginning end of yellow. So I'm able to look at my camera shot. Okay, this is what the spectral curve told me it was. I can look at what it thinks it needs to be or where it's trying to take it. And I can tint a color off the spectral curve by using my wavelengths and, my, and what I know about the nanometer reading and make a quick adjustment. So we, we had talked last night, Chris, about, um, you know, I'm gonna refer to it as, as, as wet matching, right? Because in a shop, we wet match. Uh, the thing about cameras is a camera isn't a human being, so it's not going to wet match something. It's basing it off of an algorithm, right? Yeah. So while, the, while the, the spectral curve to us is simple, there's even more behind the spectral curve, right? I mean, there's, oh, there's things happening behind the scenes there, but the spectral curve is our reference to know, okay, is this color red, blue, or green? And then where is it tight? Where is it not tight? Do I need a little bit more yellow? Do I need a little bit more red? And all those things are factoring in, right? So. When, when you talk about 
um, the algorithms and, and the way that the camera is going to see colors, the thing that you really have to factor in, and, and this is by no means telling you how to paint a car because your paint manufacturer knows how to do that. The thing about a camera is a camera is smart and the camera knows how to read a color, but the camera is not a painter and it doesn't know application, right? Yeah. So what we have to really think about here is if, if you had really great results with a camera or you got a camera and it maybe doesn't work as well as you think it's supposed to, a lot of times you have to almost shift your application thought process, right? Because I got to make me work a little bit with the camera, the way this camera's trying so to work. So the camera can then work. So it can, so it can work for me. And you know, when you talk about, you talk about some of these things with the camera, the technology is only as good as we're able to open our minds to it. Right. And, mm -hmm. and now with these cameras, you'll hear the, the paint companies say, you know, as you use it, it gets smarter, it gets smarter, it gets smarter. Well, how's that possible? They're all tied into a network. It's building a database. It's building a database. So it's building an internal database. And it's also, uh, in most situations now, it's reaching out into the webs. Yeah. So as we're mixing colors and we're seeing them hit, they're registering. So it gives you across the nation, across the country, a lot more options because everybody is coinciding with each other. Yeah. So, you know, I think that you talk about, you talk about the prep work, you talk about the light source, you know, you're talking about, you know, making the camera work and, and things like that. You did a, a spectacular video with your old paint company about ground coats. And I, I um, you know, if you could maybe just, let's talk about ground coats a little bit uh, sure. and, and where they used to be, where they're going now, and, and maybe some thoughts on that. Well, and, and there, there's been a, a, a drastic shift in thinking from not even that long ago where the perception from a painter is, and, and even the paint companies for, to a certain point, was color should be sprayed to hiding. Right. And as we know now, especially, especially now with repairing cars, at the OEM level, color is one of the more expensive coatings that's on that vehicle. So the OE is going to cut back that cost as much as they can. And what we're seeing is there's almost no true two stage paint job, just a base clear. Right. Our undercoats from the factory are starting to play to what color we're seeing on that vehicle, which the simple way of saying that is now the undercoat has turned this into a tri-coat. So almost every color that we're dealing with is a tri-coat because the color layer it does have uh, a certain level of transparency. So our undercoats and our, our shade that we're putting under a color has become as critical as the variant or the chip that we choose to put on the car and to blend. It, it's so true and I think that the mindset way back, I mean, you're like early 2000s with, with all the different solvents, if you had a yellow paint, it's, you know, put white under it and, and that was a solution. And, Unfortunately, now it's not that simple. And there's a really great example you can see here where this is, this is literally GM Velocity Yellow. And I think this is a great, a great color to look at that explains exactly what you just said. So what we're looking at here, to, to make some sense of it, because it is a little hard to determine what we're looking at. On the, on the left slide there, on the left side, that is the same amount of paint. So where you see this really bright yellow on the strip and this like gray green yellow on the strip, that's four coats of yellow paint. The one that you're looking at that is sitting over top of is the same four coats of paint, but it's over the correct L shade or the correct ground color. If you look at the photo to the right, and if you would see this live in, in person, it's even more dramatic. So you can see there, all of these yellows have the exact same amount of coats on them, all of them. And this is a, a situation where if you don't follow what the paint company is recommending for its ground because it knows what it needs, this is the trouble you run into. My yellow is too green or it's too gray or my yellow is like too bright white and, and what's the solution for that? So the, what we have to really focus on as painters and like you said, this isn't just for yellows anymore. No. If I have the wrong ground under red or the wrong ground under a translucent blue, I, I'm probably going to have an issue, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and the good thing is, is this is understand, understood all the way back to the beginning stages of color match. So when you're pulling up a formula and it's calling for a specific ground coat and you're gonna dive into that a little deeper, that is how that color is being matched. Right. So when you're looking at your variant chip, those variant chips should be sprayed over those same gray shades. And that's where this drastic shift or the shift that I mentioned, I mentioned earlier 
is it's gone from red under red, blue under blue, white right. under yellow, stuff like that, to the spectral gray or, or the, the gray, graymatic scale of white to black and every shade of gray in between. Because there is a complementary gray for every color that exists. Right. And that helps develop that color. So, yeah, and, you know, you're talking about these gray shades, and I think that, that there's a big illusion here, right? I mean, there, there is just an, a huge illusion when we're talking about color. And if you can look at the, the photos we have up here, and, you know, the hours are pointing left is top of its, the, the color is over top of itself. So it's the exact same color over top of itself versus the card on the right is the exact same color, but it's beside itself and it's got a dividing line. So you notice right away, as a painter, if someone showed you this, you would say there's no way it's the same color. Right. Because once I go three dimensional, now I'm seeing something that isn't actually there. Yeah. So I need to get, I have to get parallel and I gotta, I gotta match these guys up at the exact same dimension. I can't have one over top of the other, right? That's all important stuff. So you, you run into, you run into a, a question and I think this happens all the time with all the paint companies. I don't know if a paint company, it doesn't happen to where customer calls and says, these chips don't match. Now you could have a compromised bank. I'm not gonna argue that. You could have a technique problem or a drying problem. Um, th these things are all factors. But one of the biggest factors is how we're looking at that, right? So how do we, how do we determine it does or does not match the chip? I think that this, this photo you can see here, it does a spectacular job of explaining how this illusion happens. So on the left, we have a chip that was sprayed to the formulation. And you would be 100% confident saying that there's not a chance that that matches. So I can tell you that both of these photos are done under a true sun. So we know Kelvin's right, we know CRI's right. We have clean white light. I don't have some weird red shift yeah, or anything. Throwing something off. Right, there's, there's, there's not a light source issue here. If I look on the right, all I did was put it next to itself with a line down the middle. And now I have this visual that it actually does match. Yep, this, this goes right back to the, the gray arrow that you had going through the yellow and the blue. What's happening and when you're overlaying those chips is you're creating an optical illusion for your eye and it is tricking you into thinking that's not the right chip. Right. And, 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 and to be honest, how many of us actually thought it was important to train somebody on how to use a variant chip? Right. Right, it was, here's your box, there's the chips. When you look up the formula, it'll tell you which deck it's in. And, and that's about where it ended. Right. right. And there's guys that lay it over. There's guys that do it on the edge. Some people are very analytical and they've figured this out over time. But if you take anything away from today, just understanding how you should be evaluating color from a light aspect, as well as proper use of a chip, a lot of your problems can go away. Absolutely. And the thing is, is I think you hit the nail on the head there and I'm just going to throw back in, you know, that toner compromising issue because that is, that's a culprit. And you know, it's one of those things where sometimes we're in a rush or we think it's not that big of a deal. I have a $500 toner I didn't put in the suspension. That's, that, that's a tough conversation to have. You know, you're talking, we're talking about these grounds a little bit and, and the yellow is a great example of grounds. And I think the yellow does the best because when you don't get the right ground shade, it's always going to have a green gray or it's, it's going to get a blue hue to it. But like you had said, um, there's more than yellows with this. We have reds and blues. So if you look at this photo, this is a spectacular example of the paint company knowing what it needs, right? The paint company, when they developed this color, it knew what it needs. So on the left, you can see this. You have any idea what, what the code that is? The blue I yeah. don't. The, the red video I did, that was 3R3. 3R3, okay, so, so well known. So this it's... red fender is also 3R3. Um, so if you look on the left, I mean, it, it's all the same amount of paint, right? The, the, the coverage is the coverage. However, by the time I got enough paint on there to make that match, I'm way beyond my mill rating. Sure. It's never probably going to dry, most likely. Uh, and not only that, but I wasted, you know, 10 times the amount of color I needed. So that ground coat is, is just critical. And the check hiding stickers, I think there is some value to them to some extent, but they don't help with perceived hiding, right? right? I mean, perceived hiding is different than coverage. It's not, they're not the same conversation. When, when we're talking about some of these grounds, um, there is the technology now, and Chris and I, he kind of made fun of me last night, but that's cool. Um, <laughs> the, we have technology in our pocket that we can use every single day. And this is something that I learned probably eight or nine years ago. And Chris's joke was before we had smartphones, guys that got in this business before that, we had a different way to do this. So 
what I want to kind of explain here is you can look at this photo uh, that's, that's up right now, and it's going to show you something really cool. This, this is a red color, right? And in the event my manufacturer, my paint company, isn't telling me what ground I need, you have the solution right in your pocket. You take a photo of the spray out, and then you do a black and white conversion. So the only thing you need to make this work is you have to have your own gray shade sprayed out, which I think everybody should do that. Sure. Um, you know, when, when the paint manufacturer makes gray shade and sealer versus primer versus base coat, they're all gonna be a little bit different. They're not exact because your toner strengths are different, undercoats versus base coats, all that stuff. So what you do is you whip up your gray shades, whatever paint company you're using, make a swatch for them, make them in base and, and make them in primer or sealer. And now what you can do, if you don't know your gray shade, you're able to immediately revert to your smartphone and tell you which one it needs. So the way, the way you can prove it to yourself is take a photo of something in your shop, do this black and white conversion, and then see if it matches your gray shade. So this one I did, for example, took the photo, looked up this formula, it called for L01. So the, the one factor in here that can switch it up a little bit is the way your phone will create a black and white. So sure. is it a little darker, is it a little bit lighter? So what I did for this one, pulled up L01, L01 is the darkest gray before you get to black. So I know that in my phone, this is the darkest gray before I get to black. When I go into another color, which is this blue, you're gonna see on the blue, the gray shade it picked for that is actually black. And when I look this formula up in the system, it's giving me what we call L00, which is straight black. Yeah. So the cool thing about this is most times, especially on your translucents, the paint manufacturer's got it figured out. If something new comes out, or maybe it's a silver or a gold and they don't give you a gray shade, this is where your camera can make the magic happen. So if you look at this photo we have up now, this is actually a silver. And I can't think, I can't even count the amount of times I go into a shop and it's silver, so they, might, they make one gray shade. They pick their one gray shade. The thing that really will alter this is Coarse flake versus fine aluminum have completely different coverage rates. Sure. I mean, they are night and day. The coarser I go, the less coverage, the less coverage. which you, your mind would tell you um, it's going to hide even quicker. Yeah, it's the, it's the BBs and basketballs analogy, right, that we talk about with atomization and primer build and all that. I'm sure everybody's heard that analogy. But if you had one layer of BBs over a, in a red bin, you can barely see the bottom, right? But right. if you did that with cue balls or with basketballs, now there's all those gaps where you're able to see down through it. So it's the same approach. The coarser that aluminum, the bigger gaps there are between each one and you're able to see through it. Right, absolutely. And, and it's one of those things where if I picked too dark of a ground under a silver where I wasn't told what ground to use, and now I paint this thing and it's a shade too dark, there's a good chance that that ground impacted it. I put so much paint on and now we have this really unfortunate color shift. Yeah. And, and it's just the reality. Um, you know, it's one of those things where we have, to, uh, we have to really be ready for that and we have to use that technology you know, to help us. And Chris, you know, I'll let, I'm not gonna steal your thunder <laughs> since you made fun of me over it. Tell me how you guys did it back in the days of Microfish. Well, and, oh, it wasn't that bad. Well, it actually was. <laughs> Credit where it's due, our Dymont rep, uh, we were shooting Dymont in the shop I was at and we were struggling with certain colors, tricoat specifically, because the, they were starting to gain popularity there in the mid to early 90s. And we would take our PCB books, our production color books, which is basically the books that come out that show you all the new OEM colors. Right. We would take those and just take them to our copy machine. And instead of copying it on color, we'd just hit black and white copy. And what it would do is it would spit out a sheet in order with all the information, but it would give us the gray scale of the color that it copied. That's so perfect. So our reds would be in that LO4 area or, or, or higher towards white and, and our darks would go dark. The, the thing is though now, you know, it, it was important back then and it helped us get that repair done and out the door. But now where I see it being even more critical as well is those side tones. Right. Because, you know, flop is a difficult thing to fight, um, especially to adjust whether you need to go darker flop. It's real easy to lighten a flop, right, with a micronized white. But, but to get a flop go darker, you may have to start modifying the undercoat that you're using as well because the factory did it. Hell, there was, what, a Ford Escape? 
It was either an escape or an edge that was that came out that was a blue and it had like a red oxide undercoat from the factory and it was one of those none wow. of the grays that we did worked you had to sand through the oe find what was underneath it and as soon as we put it on we didn't have hiding but we had that invisible repair that blend out yeah and i think you know you that's a great point i mean that that ground is going to affect your side tone tremendously i mean you can look at it and it may be perceived hiding on the face and now all of a sudden I look at an angle and yeah. I can see clear through it. Big bright spot. Big bright spot or I have a <laughs> dark edge or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I think that we, we covered some of the stuff as far as the light source and how to prep the, the, the panel to make sure that we're doing this right and we're analyzing color correctly. We talked about the gray shades and chips versus, you know, versus camera. And I think, I think that the thing that is, that you brought up that is, I agree with so much is before we go and start you know, going crazy trying to tint a color. We gotta use some things to our advantage. Number one to me is a spray gun. I mean, that spray gun, that spray gun for me is is gonna give me a lot of adjustment, a lot of adjustability. So, you know, you've been with Sada now for a long time and what do you see, how do you see the guns impact guys with maybe poor color match or what do you kind of see out there in the field? You know, a couple of things, and, I, and I, I, I hate to beat up or pick on certain aspects of it, but but the spray gun that you're using, th this is our tool, right? right? As a painter, this is what's making my money. So taking care of your spray guns, making sure you're using the recommended nozzle sets that the, the paint manufacturers are saying, they're not only doing their color match, but they're evaluating every new tool. That That's part of my role now with Dan Am is, is working with the paint companies, making sure as they're developing things, we have the right equipment so it, when it actually gets commercialized and gets into a shop we're easing the pain of the customer right? right maybe a new color from the oem but if you've got the right equipment and the right paint brand everything should go nice and smooth but in the real world that's not the way it goes every time and what one of the biggest issues that i have is painters that are spraying their spray out cards differently than the way they're doing it on the car right it, it, it's whether it is a two stage, a three stage, or getting into a quad coat color, if the process that you're doing on the car is gonna call for base or, or a G shade, then base, then clear coat, then sand, then a, a nano pigment dye that's right. over top of it, then more clear. If you're not reproducing that on your spray out card, you're really doing yourself a disservice of, am I choosing the right formula? Am I close enough for this panel match? we can all blend real well, right? That is our job as, right. as a magician, as you say, right? An invisible repair. We need to make this damage disappear. We can do that with a blend, but when we are tinting or we're doing spray out cards or it's a new color and your variant deck hasn't been updated yet with those new chips, we see it all the time, right? A card just comes in. We saw with 3T5 uh, from Lexus when the, yep. the new you know, red candy came out from the factory, which was almost a true candy, right? It's a silver base that was cleared, then then red transparent mid, and then more clear. Those were hitting the ports and getting into shops before we as a paint company even got to see that color. So when it gets into your shop, you may be going through some of those hurdles and you don't have a chip. You don't have a formula that calls out the gray shade. You might have a formula, right? and that's a starting point, but now I need to do my spray outs. And you, you've got, that's where it all begins with me. If I can't just choose out of a variant deck, this one's blendable or this is a panel match. As soon as I graduate to, I need to do some mixing and start doing some spray outs. I need to be doing accurate mixes. I can't be just fudging over pours or under pours. Um, we all had our tricks, right? Our stack of dimes, pennies, and nickels next right. to the scale. Or if we wanted to leave something out, we'd throw that on and, and still maintain our accuracy on mix. Uh, but just coming back to the spray guns, using the spray gun that you're going to spray the car with, documentation, you're doing a spray out. What, what was the temperature that day? Right. What solvent selection did you use? What clear coat did you put on that panel? or on that spray out card. Hopefully it was a clear coat and not just wet with wax and grease remover. Wax and remover. I, I mean, there's, we find ways of shortcutting, leave it to painters, all of us, right? Yeah, we're all guilty of To find of ways of shortcutting things, but there's certain processes that you need to take to make to make this repair easy. Right, yeah, and you know, with the guns, it's a great point. And one of the things that we see now before that we didn't have was back in the solvent days, you'd call your jobber and you'd you know, get, a, you know, get your paint, get your paint on, they'd send you sticks and strainers, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, you'd put the strainer in, you'd pour the paint in, 
nobody really knew what the Micron was. You know, it wasn't it wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. Well, now all the all the uh, paint companies they they have a Micron requirement, right? I mean, yeah. and that's why you guys make two different types of filters because depending on depending on your your paint line, you're going to either use a 200 or 125, right? Yeah, exactly. And you bring up a very good point. I really don't think emphasis on what strainer you had or that you were using really came into play until Waterborne. Absolutely, 100%. Until as soon as Waterborne hit, then all of a sudden it became very important. And it's not just a one size fits all. Right. There are some paint manufacturers that call for a 125 strainer in their color and some that call for a 200. And it may be based on viscosity of the product or just the way it sprays, but utilizing the wrong strainer you wouldn't think by looking at these that they can cause much resistance but when it comes to your cups and the strainers that you're using in them resistance of paint flow is is actually a, a big key contributor to color is this a gravity feed or a, a siphon feed spray gun? that's a tough one it is <laughs> it's a trick question so it is a siphon feed spray gun right the cups on top. I can only answer that because Kubotic told me. So I, I, I wasn't going to say anything. It, it's on top for ergonomics and rather than like, you know, and yes, I'll date myself back with my Binks 95. When you'd have that cup, it's like trying to get that last little bit of Coke out of your, out of your soft drink, right? right. Or you're, you're trying to get it out and it's sprutting and spurting. And by putting the cup on top, as the paint runs out, it stops rather than sputtering. But we know with liner systems and with bladder systems, I can turn this gun upside down and suck all the paint out. Right. So it is a siphon feed gun. So let's think of that. There's a specific amount of energy at the front of this gun that's creating that siphoning effect, right? If, if that goes into my atomization and the way that my paint is wetting, if I take some of that energy away and make it to require collapsing a bladder system, I'm taking away from my atomization. So utilizing a cup, and we've proven this a hundred times, using a cup like the SADA RPS where it has a free flow vented system, even if I didn't have my gun hooked up to air and I had a cup on and pulled the trigger, paint will flow out of it. Right. It's going to naturally flow. There's no resistance or, or back pressure to that paint. The things that can happen with that is, is if I'm reducing the amount of flow, okay, your lab puts out a recommendation and says for this base coat spray it at 26 PSI through this nozzle set. And we hook that up and we do that with multiple different cups. We can see those color differences just by the cup that we're using. And, and where that comes from is if I'm reducing the amount of paint and I'm not siphoning out as much paint as I was supposed to as per the paint company, well, less material coming out with the same amount of atomization pressure is gonna lighten up colors. It's gonna coarsen up metallics. The same thing works in reverse, right? If I have too much material and not enough air to atomize it, I start darkening colors. It's going on too wet. My metallics and pearls start sinking in that color. So it, it is a very big, complex, whole picture scenario. Right. There's your mixing bank best practices. There's your lighting environment and where you're analyzing your chips but there's just as much emphasis put on the cups that you're using, the spray guns that you're using, the pressures that you're spraying those at, and your, just your discipline with the gun, right? Angle, distance, overlap, speed, that all comes into play. Right, you know, and, and for us as painters, we don't have the toolbox that a, that a body guy has, right? Our tools sure. are our spray gun, our fresh air supply, these are our tools. The one tool that, that nobody really talks about is our scale. Right. Sure. I mean, we that's that is the, probably one of our most it's, important tools. And it's so ignored. It, it's so ignored. And it, it's one of those things where calibration is, is, is critical. Right. And, and you're talking about some of these paint lines have very high strength toners that take, sure. you know, 0.2 grams or, or one gram of something in a big mix. And if it can't if that scale can't truly identify what a gram is, you're going to have color problems. Yeah. So, you know, aside from the, the maintenance on our guns and the maintenance on our equipment and, you know, the things that we have, that scale calibration is critical. Absolutely. Um, you know, if you don't have a scale weight, your, your paint rep will or your jobber will and, and get that calibration done, you know, do it yeah, a couple it, times a year. And it doesn't take time, right? Especially if your jobber can do it when they're coming to check your inventory, your bank and, and put in your order. Right. Tell them the next time they're coming, bring the weights for the scale and they can run through that and do a quick calibration on it. That way you know you're hitting accurate. Like you said, I mean, one gram is one thing, but two tenths of a gram. You know, we're really starting to deal with very, very fine, small increments yep. in, in our mixes. And, and accuracy on the scale, it's 
it's unfortunately ignored. It, it is, you know, mix accuracy and, and scale calibration are important. You know, Chris was talking about guns and equipment and, and these types of things. So if you look at this photo that we have up, I intentionally did not want to use something that was blatantly obvious. Like, you know, I could take a silver and, and make this incredible color shift and, and it just looks manipulated. But using that spray gun as a tool for color match is really underutilized. And I would never tell somebody to, you know, defer or, or not or not use what their paint company is telling them as far as application. But there are some things that you can do that won't harm your warranty and give you a little bit of adjustment. And one of those is, is a drop coat. Your paint companies now, most of them in the waters require a drop coat, you know, and, and to match their chip, that's generally how they're sprayed. So you want to know how the chip is sprayed so I can replicate that. But I might have a chip that's really close, but I'm putting a bumper on and it might be a little bit lighter, a little bit yellow. What I train all my shops to do is do your spray out card as per spec, tape half of it off, and then either leave the drop coat off or add the drop coat if they don't require it, and then check them. So we can see on this that the drop versus no drop side, while it's not a tremendous difference, it can be the difference between blendable and not blendable. Sure. Uh, because on your drop, so drop coat side, you're a little bit lighter, a little bit cleaner, a little bit more yellow. On your no drop, you have that little bit of a darker or reddish cast to it. So if we're doing a bumper cover or something, and it's really close, but it's slightly off, we might want to use that modified side yeah. to, to help us you know, really tighten that up. Where I started seeing a lot of that, where, where it became part of my standard process was with RR. Right. Where you had such variation from coming out of the OE where some of them on the fusions, I could get away with no drop coat on a bumper. And if I did do a drop coat, all of a sudden the sparkle and reflection off my bumper was too much. Right. So doing both, it's not gonna kill you. You gotta get it dry and, and mask off quick, do your drop coat on the other side of the panel. But now you're able to even better evaluate that vehicle because there are going to be some that just don't require a drop coat. When all day, every day, the paint manufacturer is teaching you, this is how our system works. It right. takes a drop coat. I understand. And, that. and that's correct because that they're basing it on how they match the color. Absolutely. But we have variations, right? So how do we alleviate ourselves a little bit with not a lot of effort? And that's yep. one of them. And you know, I want to show here what this difference is like. So if you look at this photo that's up now, it's it's a, a an obvious comparison that you have the drop coat versus sp uh, the spray to spec side, and it's only a little bit off. And that's what we're looking for sometimes. It's not maybe a drastic. Oh, I got to get it way more red or way more green. I just need to be a little bit X yeah. and many times that can do that. So when you do these spray out cards that you do on every car you paint, tape half off, do drop coat or no drop coat, clear it right in the back, drop or no drop, document this thing. And when that car comes back in or a different car comes back in with that code, there's a chance that, that you got, you got something to work with there. Yeah. And doing that as well as knowing how you can affect things. If it does have a series of solvents, solvent evaporation rate can change colors so knowing how that's going to affect it same thing with the spray guns if you can manipulate things in your spray out with pressures or distance and the way that you're spraying that color you're just building a stronger library right but it but it really comes down to documentation guys i i'm terrible i'm constantly walking around with a sharpie in my pocket because there's a note i need to make somewhere about something that i just did so that three months from now when I see that same color and nothing seems to be working, but I have this spray out card. If I have a spray out card that just dead nuts matches it, but I don't have any information on the back of it. Right. I'm really starting from zero. Doesn't do much good. Yeah, exactly. You know, and you, we had talked earlier about, about how we look at color and, and color chips and, and things like that. And we talked about how to manipulate, you know, just how to manipulate that spray out that you do. So one thing that I think you said that was very smart, uh, you know, a little while back is that we don't ever really intensively train somebody how to look at a chip, right? And, and if you look at the, the picture we have up right now, it's showing you two really important things. Um, number one is it's showing you how to look at the face and flat. So I'm straight on and I'm at an angle. And the other thing it's showing me is how not to look at a chip. So if we think back on how tremendous the difference was on the yellow, it will happen to every color. So on this silver, I go from having something that is a spectacular match to what now appears to be a poor match. And that's where we, we fight ourselves. So this goes from getting it in the booth to tinning, just like that, yeah. right? And you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where 
when you're looking at a chip, I love the two people method. And one of the reasons why, and that you go back to that, that yellow and, and blue uh, picture we had up earlier, the surrounding environment can drastically alter what you're seeing. And you take a pro white, for example, and let's just say I'm wearing a, a yellow or a red shirt and I get on top of that chip and I hit it with light and it reflects back to me, it's gonna take the red back to the chip. So I'm not really seeing what I'm thinking I'm seeing. The two people method is great because one person can hold it up, the other person can hold their true son straight back and look at it without my body or my clothing or anything in the way. If you have a blue building and you're, you're matching outside and you got a blue wall behind you, that can, that can harm you too. Yeah. So your environment is really critical. So if you know Calvin, if you know CRI, if you have a great spot, but all of a sudden you have two cars side by side and one's yellow and one's blue, you can talk about that arrow from earlier that that will dramatically change what you're seeing. Yeah. Yep. So I think that, you know, when you're, when you're talking about color, when you're talking about color matching and how we see color and the things that will affect us, cars now versus cars from the year 2000, the body lines on them, the way, you know, the things just shift so much. You look at these new challengers. I think that's one of my favorite examples. If you look at that car from the rear three quarter, every painter in the world would say that quarter doesn't match that match door. door yeah. And it's solely based on a bend. When you think about a bend, the bend isn't just for a challenger. It's for anything that's got contour. So if you look at the photo that we have up now, I love this example. And all the stuff that, that we have up today that you're looking at, you can replicate it in your shop. I and mean, this isn't complicated. And this is great because it's a very basic generic silver. It's nothing special. It's, I think it's PS2. And all you do is you put a bend in it. And my, my favorite way to think about this is this is a trunk. So the left side is the flat trunk. The right side is where it's bending down. And I am sure that's two different colors. It's not. It's all about how we look at it. And when you talk about looking at these, these colored chips and our spray outs or whatever we're making, it's important that where we're painting the car, we're matching not only correctly with a gap, but we're using a contour because that can shift it. If I have a, a fender that's going up to a convex bumper, I have a, a metallic that's either gonna bend this way or that way. Yeah. That alters what I'm seeing. So you really wanna look at more than, than just, okay, hold the chip up. Think about the shape of the panel. Think about you know what, how, what part of the car you're painting. All these things matter, oh, right? Sure. How many times is the, is the rear bumper off the vehicle and you're taking the chip and you're putting it at that bottom edge of the quarter and it's just a flat chip to a flat quarter. You're trying to get it on the right angle, but then the way that bumper goes on when it snaps in on the side, it does make it either convex or concave. Right. That really needs to come into consideration on how that, that panel is gonna meet the adjacent panel or the panel that you're not blending. Yeah, for sure. You know, and just one more thing on these on these color chips, because looking over at, at your uh, air over there, it made me think about it. One of the things that that is that can ruin a color match real quick is I see a guy spraying water and he's got a sada, puts a coat on, puts the gun sideways. The thing about that is the way you're drying, not only the way you're drying, but what that paint requires for drying. And if you look in some of these different manufacturers of paint, they'll tell you, you know, put a medium wet coat on, put your air movers on, flash till mat, get coverage, do your drop coat, but don't force dry the drop coat. The reason they're telling you not to force dry the drop coat is they don't want to stand that flake up. Yeah. It needs time to relax. So if we're, if we're manipulating our drying process, that's going to manipulate the color as well. Sure. Yeah. You're blowing, you're blowing your drop coat dry so that you can get it cleared and go evaluate that vehicle. And, and that's not going to be what you do when you actually refinish the vehicle. Right. So I think that pretty much covers everything today for yeah. color. So yeah. I guess we'll see you guys in a couple hours for 